Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Well, this week I have a photographer joining me who shares a love, like me, of everything bike and everything Swedish. Yes, Patrick Harrison. Patrick Harrison's name is synonymous with natural, spontaneous and engaging imagery. Originally from Nottinghamshire, he studied photography BA at Manchester Polytechnic and then started shooting reportage features and portraits all around the world for The Face magazine more than 25 years ago. His, uh, his candid style, ability to capture the moment and delivery of warm, honest reportage photography has led to a successful career as a commercial photographer. He is uh, regularly commissioned by top agencies and global brands to shoot creative lifestyle image banks for clients such as Canon, British Gas and the uh, most recently the Danish company uh, Orsted, the global leader in wind power. Patrick and his family live in Hackney, uh, East London and as often as they possibly can in their log cabin in Sweden. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Harrison to your screens. There he is. There's the great man himself. <laughs> In perfect, perfectly pixelated harmony. Okay. <laughs> Let's hope that improves. <laughs> Let's hope technology does us a favour. How are you doing, Pat? Yeah, I'm good actually. Really good. What a, what a scorcher of a day. It's absolutely marvellous, isn't it? Absolutely, Brilliant. yeah. I'm I'm burning up in this office here, I must say. <laughs> so if I if I increase in in red colour as as the transmission uh, progresses, then please excuse me, my glasses might steam up as might yours. <laughs> You've been uh, been keeping keeping well. I have, yeah, very well actually, yeah. Three months off, so um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going, all going well. It's nice. Yeah, I'm spending as much time as I can outside, and you know, trying to get through it all like we all have, really. So yeah, yeah. indeed, indeed, yeah, tricky, uh, tricky situation. Things are slightly, slightly started to improve though, which is good. Good to kind of see yeah. uh, around the world things loosening. So let's see what kind of happens uh, going going forward. But we'll you know we'll touch a bit on that um, a bit later. I think. Before we before we kick off, uh, I, I did this last week with Carlo, and it was pretty interesting. I thought we could touch on your first um, your first photography jobs, um, primarily because uh, your your not paid job, as we um, as as I touched on, uh, is for a very interesting um, uh, very interesting area. Um, so tell us, you mentioned it was to me rather. You mentioned that it was for Soul Underground magazine. Um, of a pretty famous DJ. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so um, after leaving uni, I just kind of jumped on a train, moved to London, and went to a record store and had a look at all the magazines and wrote down the contact details of all those music magazines that I was interested in. And the person, the only one that kind of called me back, was this magazine called Soul Underground. That was um, kind of it wasn't really a magazine. It was like a fanzine, really. So it was only published in black and white. Um, and I went to see the guy in his, in his tiny, tiny office, really scruffy, and he gave me a job straight away and uh, to photograph Trevor Nelson, DJ, soul DJ, who, you know, I'd never heard of. I doubt if anybody had ever heard of. He was about 20 years old. So, um, yeah, so that was my genuinely first job. Um, but, you know, it was unpaid. <laughs> yeah, but it was. It, 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 yeah. It did happen. It did happen to be photographing someone who who later uh, and still is uh, became a pretty successful globally uh, renowned DJ. Crazy, right? Yeah. Who? So that's yeah. cool. That, that's definitely <laughs> that's cool. a cool first gig, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, bit, bit, a bit different to your your first. He was a nice before. fellow as well. It's worth saying. I can still remember. So, yeah, it's very, very nice, very welcoming. That's I good. Gladly photographing with uh, 
Okay. Have you? Uh, have you? Um, we're having some t slight technical difficulties on this call, on this on this conversation today. So, if you're watching, do bear with us. And hopefully, it will it will improve. Pat's ah, kind of bop, free, bopping free, it free, out. Free. He's there, yeah. and he's not. So we'll 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 see how it goes. I might have to fly fly singly for a while. Um, you're back on. That's good. I'll I'll control it. I can see it all going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Let me know. that. Yeah. yeah, we can. If we need to switch to, to to a different tech, then we'll we'll give it a go. But you're here now, so you know, 1989. Um, that was 31 years ago. Have you tried to photograph him since? No, but that that would be a really good idea. Actually, that would be really fun. Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly remember him. Him. I doubt if he would remember me at all. <laughs> but, um, no, that would be really cool. He's, he's not aged that much, actually, has he? I think he's, you know, he's looking really good for his age. So uh, I probably look like an old man now, but who knows? Well, you take, if you <laughs> I take, might do that. Take, take the picture along that you showed me of yourself 30 years ago and see if he recognizes you. Because, you know, he was starting <laughs> out and you were starting out. There could be, you know, there could be some good recognition there. Yeah. Good idea. I hope so. So good, good, nice, nice one. I love, I love kicking off with things like that. I mean, that's a, a, a pretty amazing first shoot, to be honest. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I've heard any that are quite as good as that. Um, so, on that note, keeping with that uh, amazing air of positivity, I'd like to kick off with the, with the pictures that we've agreed to discuss. Um, and the first one, you know, I think the, well, I'd like to come to this after we've looked through the pictures because I think um, talking about your the influences that we've um, th that you you explained to me, and this shot of Trevor Nelson uh, and your COVID project, it's very interesting to see where your professional photography is taking you. Um, uh, you know, the, I, I said in the intro, you're very well known for strong, clean lifestyle photography, um, and and we'll show some of that. Uh, funnily enough, though, the first shot that we've got to put up is. It's all obviously, obviously about lifestyle, but it's definitely not very clean. So what is the story behind this filthy sofa, the scruffy scruffy sofa for Berghaus? <laughs> so this sofa was, um, it was a, quite an organized shoot for Berghaus. So we got a license to shoot in the Peak, in the Peak District and we had uh, Leia Crane, the climber, yeah. along yeah. for the shoot and, shoot. and she was modeling some of their clothes and that kind of thing. And she, and she was absolutely brilliant. I mean, you know, she was doing handstands on dry stone walls and oh, cartwheeling everywhere and doing lots of fun stuff. And um, then on a walk through the woods, we just spotted this sofa, which, which was absolutely, I mean, I was probably over, over, overly excited about the sofa that was covered in moss, actually. I don't think anyone, anyone else actually appreciated it as much as I did. <laughs> but, but, um, I just absolutely loved it. I, I loved the way that nature had just taken this sofa and it was kind of pulling it back into the woods you know the, the moss is grow, growing all over it and you can physically see it just sinking away and it was kind of camouflaged in all the tree, trees it was um yeah i thought it was quite quite a poignant little message for you know nature grabbing things back and kind of keeping it the way it, the way it likes to keep things so um yeah and you know sofa kind of, re kind of represents the home and all that kind of stuff and yeah there's a few interesting thoughts thoughts and Communicating a few different interesting ideas around that. So yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I particularly like. I, I love it for m many reasons. Actually, I, I, I'd love to ask, did you sit on it? Because you know, all that moss surely would have made it more comfortable. <laughs> we didn't actually. You can't really tell in the picture, but it was very wet. So um, yeah, I don't think we did sit on it. So yeah. No, probably probably a good idea, and and I mean personally, I'd love yeah. to see the wider situation to see how close you are to a road or how how that how that even got to that place because, because uh, a sofa in the middle of the Peak District is is pretty obscure. I mean, you know, uh, fly tipping in the UK is is a clear problem, uh, and that's that's a perfect example. Um, probably should be used. In some kind of campaign for for, for anti fly tipping, if you ask me, I think um, I, I think it's not the correct way to recycle your sofa at all. No, no, yeah. no, it's definitely not. Don't I, try. Yeah. It at home. Yeah. If don't don't leave your sofa in the garden because this is what's going to happen to it. 
but it's great. It's a killer shot. Really, really love it, and it's a really great one to to start off with. Um, moving from from the the world's scruffiest sofa, uh, we're going to pop over to a shoot the the shoot that you and I worked on um, a horribly long time ago. So we don't need to talk about the year, uh, but this was. Um, Exactly what I described in uh, in the in the intro. Uh, it was a commission to shoot um, a lifestyle or an image bank of lifestyle images for for um, for Canon um, for Canon Expo specifically back in whenever. And um, I love this. We were in Norfolk. Uh, I drove up and found you in a field full of balloons. There's the first shot of the guy with the red and white balloons. So tell me, what was going through your head with this? You know, when when we were roaming the fields of Norfolk with loads of balloons, had you ever done anything quite, um, quite of this nature before? Uh, probably not. No, because it's um, it was quite. Uh, what's the word? I don't know. I mean, I quite looking working quite freely. Do you know what I mean? I quite, quite like coming up with ideas for the moment. So we had a really good art director with us. I remember. And he brought along these enormous balloons. I mean, I'd never seen balloons that size before in my life <laughs> once they were blown up. And um, clearly with those colours, and we were so, so lucky with the weather, perfect blue sky, it just, you know, just hit the spot really. I mean, it's amazing. And I, I probably took about four or 500 shots of that guy with those balloons, and I don't think there's a kind of a bad shot, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. it just worked. It, you know, when something just clicks and it kind of, the sand dunes were great, the beach was great, the sky was great, the sky was great, the sea was great, he was great, the balloons were bad. Yeah, I mean, that's what you want, really, isn't it? That's perfect. Yeah. It was. I mean, it, it was the sharpest, most beautiful kind of corporate imagery I think I've, I've ever, ever seen, really. And, you know, it kind of consistently got, got better and better. I mean, obviously, the, the, the colours were meant to be representative of the, the Canon logo with balloons. Uh, and they were trying to bring sort of a, a real feeling of, of, of nature and, and humanity into all the shots, which you, you did remarkably well. I mean, very, very beautiful, really super strong um, and, and kind of amusing, really, uh, you know, when you, when you think about it, kind of trailing after somebody in fields with lots of balloons. But it, it wasn't just the balloons that you were, you were shooting, was it? We, uh, we, I, I love the shot that you shared, um, which I think actually I... I I'd kind of forgotten from the shoot, to be honest, of the guy's legs. What what right. um, uh, was this part of the art direction? I, uh, you know, did was there a specific instruction, or is this just a perfect a, a little favourite? I um, I think the only art direction we had was the guy and a yellow hoodie because it was a, it was a we had to get that yellow colour into a shot, and we were. Was it Hokan Beach we were at? I think it was yeah. Hokan, wasn't it, on the Nor Norfolk coast, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's quite rare, rare in Britain. You've got pine forests opening out onto acres and acres of sand going towards the sea, which is just beautiful. So um, we just went for a walk, didn't we, in the woods, I think. Yeah, we did, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and all of a sudden, this guy in his jeans and his legs and the trees and the, you know, so it just came together again. So really nice. But I like the way it's really nice and graphic. And kind of, you know, there's a little bit of humour in there, but not too much. But it's kind of nice, simple colours again. It is, yeah. 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 I think this was um, this this uh, image, or rather, this image highlights perfectly something that I sort of discovered about you when um, when we met and when I saw your pictures. Is is the sharpness, the incredible sharpness and detail that you you managed to get of this guy's hairs and the goose pimples on his legs. Now you. Um, I was unaware this was was a possible tech at the time, but you told me about how you um, sort of fine sharpened all your lenses, um, sort of tuned them effectively to your between the camera and the, and the lens. Uh, and I never heard of anyone doing that uh, since. Yes, I have. There's various technologies out there which you can you can get to do such a thing. Uh, but you were the first person I'd come across who who had done this, and I think that's. Possibly one of the little the little things that kind of highlights the quality of your imagery and why they're always so so sharp, as we can see in clearly those shots from Canon. Um, did you 
did you dis- uh, when did you discover that little secret and and how often would you say you have to retune your lenses? Um, I, I think as ever, you know, you only discover these things when you when you have a problem. So when you do a shoot and you know you're shooting pretty much wide open the whole day, and on the back of the camera they look fine, but then later on that evening you're thinking, no, 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 there's something wrong here. This, you know, yeah. something, and it's just that fraction. You know, it's the difference between focusing on the the eyelash and focusing on the cheek instead, or that kind of, which really frustrates me and really annoys me. So um, yeah, and then I just did a bit of research and found that you could micro adjust all your lenses. You know, each lens individually as you put it on, you can go to the settings and change all that, which made you know a lot of difference actually. And then to be able to shoot confidently and just look through the camera and press the button is kind of what what we all need, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, that makes a big difference. So yeah. It's a great. It's a great thing to have discovered, and you know, I know since that, since having met you, there's a number of photographers I've worked with who've done the same thing. But it really shows in your pictures. All of your images are all just so fabulously sharp and kind of almost hyper real. Actually, I'd say when we when we go through them. Uh, so the, the the next shots I wanted to show are uh, a, a shoot that you did originally for Genesis Bikes. Um, now both being crazy keen cyclists. Um, I love this, I love this image where you've got the weavy road. So I'm going to pop it up on screen and just love you to give us a couple of minutes behind the story behind this and the next image that I'll throw up. Uh, yeah, so it was the rebrand of Genesis Bikes um, and it was the first year of the rebrand where they got their new logo that everyone will recognize from now. It's quite a few years ago now, but they've kept that brand for a long time. Um, and we just took a bunch of people in the back of a van and a bunch of bikes, went to Yorkshire and just had a fabulous shoot over three days. It was pretty much as easy as that. When you work with people that are so enthusiastic about what they do, mm. they're so professional and they've just got that passion. It's just, I mean, that's just the best experience ever. You know, it's kind of, it's too easy to take the right picture. Um, and they knew the area like the back of their hands. So they knew where to go. I've never shot so many different locations in one day because we could just fly around and they knew exactly where, you know, the light at that time of day and where it would look great and what section of road to use. And wow, amazing. Just absolutely perfect. I mean, that kind of knowledge. Local knowledge is, is brilliant. So the job was really lovely to shoot. I loved every minute of it. Um, yeah, and, you know, you get nice pictures when you're in those sort of situations. So. You do, yeah. yeah. And only thank all the team, really. They were great. So, yeah. I love, I love the fact in this particular image that, you know, you've got the three cyclists. I mean, the timing there is pretty tight. I mean, ridiculously tight uh, <sighs> to, to get them in. So, you know, k- kudos to you for managing that one. Uh, obviously, having, you know, it sounds like you had a great team to, to talk about kind of locations and, and take you to the right places at the right time. Um, yeah, but the second image from that shoot, is is equally beautiful but very different uh so taking a break again highlights you know the way that your images are super sharp and kind of very natural punchy colors in the environment um this one was whereabouts in the peak district do you recollect um i can let you into a tiny secret it's shot in wales that one that's not in the peak <laughs> what you've blown my mind I think I think it's long enough since to uh, yeah that one's not actually shot in Yorkshire that's shot in uh, in Wales in Snowdonia but um, yeah oh, really? excellent well it looks like it was a typical wet Welsh day in that case and it was a pretty lousy day but you know interesting clouds which yeah. is kind of yeah. like, always good always good so um, and always and rain always brings out a bit more richness especially in in, in rock formations and so you. Yeah, I mean, it worked. It worked nicely. I love this. Uh, it kind of, I can picture myself sat on those rocks, right there. Uh, That's right. So it's a quite, quite a fair. So um, yeah, you'd appreciate the bike there, Charlie. I think I would. Yes, exactly. <laughs> my own. It, it is indeed exactly my own bike. Um, so I can totally be that person. In fact, maybe I should be a subject for a shoot uh, by you, and uh, maybe we should go and shoot together in fact that would probably make more sense wouldn't it yeah, call that work that's great yeah let's do it. <laughs> exactly yeah cameras and bikes 
it's yeah is that work it's it's mm. it's where the words merge isn't it sort of pleasure and <laughs> pleasure of work yeah. um very different though moving from wales to to the last uh the last job that you worked on before before lockdown before the world changed forever um this this is uh it's a killer shot um it's so so strong um that i it, I think it epitomizes almost everything I've sort of said and we've talked about. Uh, this is a, a very cool rollerblader, but where is he? Where is he? He's, uh, he's in Cape Town. He's in South Africa. So, you know, <sighs> it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> it's lovely light and fantastic locations. Yeah, and just pretty much the dream place to shoot, really. If you're lucky enough to go there, yeah. And you said, I believe, that you were in the middle of this shoot um, and had to return. Is that correct? You had to return, uh, kind of, right at the end, of, just before lockdown kicked off. No, it wasn't. It was. It was a couple of months before lockdown, so it wasn't. Oh, okay, apologies. We, yeah, we were fine. We got it all under wraps. No, so, it was, uh, you were. Yeah. You were in the middle of prepping the next part of the shoot. That was. That was right. Yeah, that's right. So both of these shots then were in uh, in Cape Town. Um, the lady sat on the rock. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's uh, up in the hills. I forget which uh, country park it was surrounding, but um, yeah, I mean, just amazing shooting in the national parks. And, yeah. And in these in these shoots, were you always with um, a team of, of stylists, uh, wardrobe, etc., or did you control any of that your, yourself? We used a local production company over there, and. Um, yeah, with that there was makeup, there was stylists. It was quite a big team. Um, but saying that, the one the shot in the national park, they were kind of in a car park in the national park, and we took a hike around the corner and up the rocks. Yeah. So it was just myself and assistant, the models, um, and the art director. I think it was quite a small team that just kind of went up there, and we just did our own thing for an hour or so, which is yeah, a nice way to work. It's really good. Yeah. And um, what what would you say the sort of percentages of your of your shoots that you do that are small, small crew, big crew kind of, kind of thing. Cause you've referred to sort of having 20 odd people on set before, whereas now obviously you just say you've run up the hill with a couple of people. It's probably about 50, 50, if I'm honest, I think, um, maybe more small scale shoots than large ones. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, you know it kind of depends what comes in really, but, uh, I'm really comfortable working in both situations. I really, I really like working one on one as well. Just kind of, you know, I do a lot of portrait shoots, which is just me and the person, no assistant, no nothing, and that's that's wonderful. Really enjoy that. Back to yeah. basics. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, you're. It's good to be good to be flexible. Good to keep it fresh, I think, and mix it up a bit. So yeah. Indeed, comfortable, comfortable in all situations, and regardless of the situation, you come out with stonking shots, really. So, so, so I'd like to say, I mean, it's, um, you know, looking through your, your wider portfolio, it, it really sort of shows, um, a, a style that you've obviously a very much a signature style, I should say, that you've developed over, over the years. Um, and I'm kind of interested to, to ask kind of at what point did you see your, this style really emerging? Because you highlighted to me, or mentioned to me a few a few influences, um, which I I kind of did a bit of a bit of looking into really. I mean, I remember I, I know Elliot Erwitt. In fact, I've met Elliot Erwitt nine oh, wow. year, nine years ago. Uh, I'm going to put a picture up in a minute uh, mm. and explain. So I know I I mean I don't know him, but I've I have met him. I've met Martin Parr and been to many talks. He's another person that you mentioned, and I think out of the Influences that you mentioned, being others being Brian Griffin, Ouija, and William Klein, Elliot Erwitt um, and Martin Pass definitely stand out. When I kind of look back over their work and I reference it to, to yours, I kind of clearly see some evidence um, evidence there of, of it. And I, I, I can't... Um, I'm going to put this up on screen and then actually what I'll do, Pat, is I'll send this to you on WhatsApp because I didn't share this with you beforehand. Um, it's an image or a little, a, a little, um, 
You're frozen, Charlie. Are you back with me? Yeah, I lost. I lost, I lost the last bit. I'm afraid. That's it. Okay. Uh, I was explaining that I put together a little uh, document um, image that I'm going to put up on the screen that I hadn't um, actually shared with you. So I'm going to do that so we can just talk through it briefly. Uh, I'll send it to you on WhatsApp, assuming okay. uh, assuming technology um, works for us all. Uh, and I'm going to put this up on the on the screen now. So. The reason I'm doing this is because having looked over Elliot Erwitt's work, I saw a definite sort of similarity between some of his and yours. And, and then, you know, I've asked the question, I'd like you to sort of speak from now. Um, but this was just a, a sort of starting point for conversation. So the picture that is on the, uh, uh, of Elliot with a fish in his pocket, that was something I took at a, a Magnum exhibition <laughs> nine nine years ago I think nine or ten years ago uh, and I was with a bunch of friends and we put the cigarette in the fish's pocket because the fish was in his pocket already we, we put the cigarette in the fish's mouth sorry so that's my that's my time meeting uh, meeting Mr. Elliot but these pictures here of the ballet dancers at the bar and the beach and the bulldogs on the steps and the, and the, and the guy on the bench I feel are all very uh, very symptomatic of the type of work that uh, you've developed. So, taking that into account, and and another work from Martin Parr, uh, sort of his Benidorm, uh, and what is it? Think uh, Think of England. Um, mm. Where would you say that you started to see your style emerging? And would you agree in that sentiment that those guys had some sort of influence in? I mean, you mentioned influence, but really kind of their style is feeding through to what you now shoot and are, and are well known for. Yeah, I think, um, I think I always appreciated their spontaneity. And whether that was actual spontaneity or whether it's kind of uh, choreographed spontaneity is, you know, something really wonderful. Yeah. It's kind of almost an element of surprise in everything that they do. Um, or it's an element of something being so direct that kind of, you can't escape it. Do you know what I mean? It's really graphic and it's kind of it's just there, but it never looks it never looks overly forced. And there's always with an element of a little bit of sense of humour to it. Uh, Absolutely. I don't know. That always appealed to me. Not taking yourself too seriously and kind of you know and don't really patronise the viewer either. Either it's kind of you know trying to. I don't know what it is, but anyway, I love their stuff. Um, I don't know whether I consciously tried to emulate what they were doing or copy it, but you know, if you take it all in, and I mean, as photographers, I think we absorb so much information anyway. Mm. We're forever looking at imagery and you know, comparing and taking bits from it. You never stop learning about your own stuff and everyone else's stuff that you look at. So, you know, it's a combination of all that together, really. But um, I definitely think when you start to shoot commercially, to keep that clarity of vision and that kind of separation from background to foreground and the bit that's interesting keeping that on its own and kind of really quite obvious within a nicely composed shot is kind of quite key to it being working quite successfully commercially yeah and yeah. Uh, so that's that's something that works and yet you wouldn't look at their stuff and see it as being commercial photography really you'd see it as being you know a bit voyeuristic and a bit kind of reportage so um Indeed, yeah. but I think there are exactly the notes that I, I wrote down about spontaneity and an and element of humour. When I look through some of your shots, there's always there's that little element of humour or laughter or happiness, and I think that that feeds through. Um, but, but you're you're right. I mean, there's um, your commercial imagery is obviously far, far more crafted, and theirs is far more spontaneous. But you've definitely retained that sort of that feel um, across. And when you look at those pictures from Elliot or those pictures from Martin, um, I think you ma you managed to do do that quite well. So clearly, those those parts are sort of stuck in your head from from way back um, <laughs> when you when you got tired of shooting shooting dance dance halls and, and ravers and music makers. Yeah, that, so that was my time of time of being a war photographer. I think you know. Plucking up the courage to go to the middle of the dance floor with a camera was kind of yeah. <laughs> at the height of acid house was a bit crazy. So yeah, yeah. well we'll show that we'll show those in a second. But I mean, um, 
that that's probably it's a, it's a good uh, opportunity really to discuss. You know, we talked about you shooting for the face. We talked about you uh, photographing Trevor Nelson. We're going to chuck up some of the some of the images that you've been working on during during the last three months. But when when did you make a, a sort of a physical switch, like you know, going from that more documentary dance floor music making? Uh, photographer to being the more crafted commercial was it a gradual thing over time did you notice did you, it, or did you was, consciously it was something that I needed to do basically on a financial level because I wasn't getting paid to do what I loved to do and I didn't want to stop doing what I wanted you know didn't want to stop doing it but somehow I needed to get paid to do this uh, and I absolutely loved working for those music and all the sort of youth culture magazines and stuff but um Unfortunately, it wasn't paying the rent, so um, no. yeah, I needed to go down a slightly more commercial route, and uh, yeah, but you know, taking a bit of element from that, and I think what I probably learned from that is, you know, starting out working editorially is very often you have to get something out of nothing, you know, you're given a brief, you yeah. go to the, you ring a doorbell, you, you take some pictures, you've got to come back with something that will sit comfortably on the pages of a magazine, and there's only you there most of the time, so... And you might only have half an hour, you know, so it's kind of uh, the pressure's on really to, to get a result. And I think doing that over and over again just keeps it really, keeps it really fresh every time. You kind of learn a lot of, a lot of tricks really, I suppose, without even realising what they are. But um, yeah. yeah. A lot of people management, I think, um, when you're mm. doing, especially doing editorial, you go and you don't know those people, you've got to try and come out of it with something good, as you say. Um, and, and that pays into most certainly the type of work that you're doing now, the type of images we've seen, because you, you, you've got to work with your subjects and you know, they're, they're, they're not clear, empty landscapes, are they? They're all people doing mm. things and, and you have to mould them to what you are and the art director are looking for. So that's clearly a, clearly a, strong, a strong trait that you've taken from those editorial days. So maybe maybe to tip um, tip over into your editorial days and your and your COVID project, which uh, obviously we've we've discussed uh, talked about this a, a few times, um, but the I think the fascinating thing is that that you started scanning loads and loads of your images back from these aforementioned crazy days. So I'm going to put up um, I'm going to put up the hacienda shot. And I'd love you to tell us a little story behind uh, behind this, and and more actually. I'll flick it up and then tell us about the project that you've you've been working on. Yeah, so um, probably three weeks into COVID, uh, I was just spending more and more time on my phone and researching little things, and it seemed to be all of a sudden the stuff I shot thirty years ago. There was kind of a thing happening around that time, and thirty years seemed to be a long enough time for it to be kind of historically important or to be something, you know what I mean? That even younger kids were kind of looking up to or getting getting things from and appreciating what was going on. So I thought, well, hang on a minute. I, I shot loads of stuff around that time, you know, nightclubs and street stuff and youth culture. So I dug it all out, started scanning, and then chatted to you and then thought, well, heck, why don't I try and sell some prints? So get a little Shopify shop, get that together, post stuff on Instagram and see what the response is. And... Uh, about a week later from it going live, I got a, an email from the guy wearing a black jumper in that Hacienda picture, who was Tim. And he, he said, that's a picture of me, Hacienda, I can't believe it, 30 years ago, you could have featured me there. So that, the whole story just made a beautiful circle. So it was kind of, you know, if, if I don't sell any other pictures, I'm so happy that Tim's happy with his print. And, uh, it, you know, I'm happy with the picture. I, you know, it's great and lovely. Lovely to get all that stuff out there again, really. It's kind of, um, you know, I've got really fond memories of that time. Doing what I love doing in all those situations, it was the best best job in the world as far as I was concerned. So, um, yeah, yeah well, big, goes that, big goes out again. And I guess there's, there's a lot of kudos around the Hacienda and that kind of thing and the Manchester music of that time, um, all the Manchester stuff and the Stone Roses and that kind of thing. It's, you know, there's still a lot of interest around it. So um, I'm lucky enough to have been there to shoot the stuff with the face originally. Very lucky to be commissioned to do that. That's amazing. So um, yeah, yeah, drag it all out and show it. See what happens. It's, yeah. a, it's a fascinating catalogue. Um, so, 
so Pat uh, set up under a brand called Spotted For You, and mm. uh, that can be found on the web uh, and also on Instagram. And there are way more shots than I could even begin to show here today of, of 30 years ago and the way that everyone, ourselves clearly included, used to party. Um, and, and uh, you know, for me, I never made it to the Hacienda. Uh, I, was, I was down south in different places. But this shot is um, is super, and the, and the, and the story behind, you know, the, what are the chances of the guy in the, in the middle finding this picture and finding you? That that I think is modern technology. That is the beauty of hashtags, isn't it? That's lovely, isn't it? Yeah, there's a real connection, and I've had lots of nice comments as well coming through. You know, people saying, "Oh God, why can't we relive those times?" You know, and kind of, I think especially now going through COVID, people. You know, when they were 18, 19, 20 and had those fantastic nights 30 years ago. Yeah. They've had the time to really think about it a little bit and, you know. Yeah. yeah I think it's, it's quite poignant. It's quite nice. Yeah. It is. It's definitely poignant. And I wish you, wish you much luck with the sales because I think there's, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of interest, as you rightly say. Uh, I personally know someone who's very interested in, in the next shots, right, which uh, Hacienda is one thing from back then. Uh, I was a huge fan of the Stone Roses, uh, and and you not only had the pleasure of shooting the Hacienda, pleasure should I say privilege? I'm not sure which is the, the correct word, but you also had the pleasure and the privilege of shooting Spike Island. Now, uh, this is is you know quite something else to have been there. Now I I know a friend who was there. I sent him a link to some of your shots, and and he was blown away uh what was it like especially being there with the camera in hand trying to document this <laughs> it was quite chaotic if i'm being perfectly honest um and most you know so unlike any modern day festivals we're used to nowadays you know where uh it was so basic i think there was you know one hot dog van and a chip stall that that was kind of it and most people were there for over 12 hours. So it was kind of not, nothing in the way of entertainment apart from loads of loud music, but like getting lost in the wind. Um, and thousands of people, like-minded people, which, you know, it's kind of, it was very raw. It was, it was very raw, very real. So, um, but a beautiful day, sun was shining, everyone in a fantastic mood. And I don't recollect anybody refusing to have their picture taken. Out of all the people we stopped and, you know, stuck, basically stuck a camera in their face wondering, Climbing over people, wandering through the crowd. It was, yeah. yeah, just a very, very positive vibe. Really, really nice. Yeah, it's very cool. I mean, you look at that, and I'd forgotten all about. I mean, not the charlatans because they were on the radio the other day, but those jeans. And now those jeans are like epic. The amount of, the amount. It's not about. It's not about the amount of people that were there. It's about, about the amount of denim. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's, I love it. This this shot that you took at the back of these guys is just awesome. Like I, it's just you know, if you were at Spike Island, you need to have that shot on your wall. That's all I'm saying. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tag this video with Spike Island and tell everyone to go there yeah. because uh, you must have photographed a lot of denim on that particular day. It's a, it's a sea of stonewash and white t-shirts actually. When you when you go through all the necks, it's just kind of like one after the other. Yeah. I should have that printed on a T-shirt. Actually, I think that's my ultimate goal: is to get that that shot of those three pairs of jeans on the T-shirt, and then I'll be. Oh my that's god! Probably, you that's will, probably good. it will fly. It will yeah. fly. Ha I don't know what the hashtag would be. Uh, might be might be a tricky one. The question is though: Did you hear the music? Like you know, I mean, you're there photographing, but did you actually hear the gig? Because when you're photographing, sometimes you don't really listen. You know. Yeah, not, not really. I, I spent the most of the time when the gig was on. I was obviously clear thousands of people rushed, rushed to the stage and rushed to the You can't take pictures like this. So, um, might not be able to hear me. I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, we heard you. You, you broke up. You were talking about how everyone was rushing to the stage. <laughs> yeah, so I spent most of the time when the gig was on just kind of around the back of the field, which is mainly all the people that were completely, you know, <laughs> having a great time so um yeah. but i got some really really nice shots they were all pretty chilled out so uh yeah that was the safest place to be with the camera when the gig was going so um 
but a nice place to take pictures anyway. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, great. I mean, super cool privilege to have been there. Um, very, very, very amazing. Yeah, I mean, do you think that was classified as your most exciting shoot, if you think about it, or have you have you bettered that in in recent times? Um, I don't know. I think like you have lots of exciting shoots for different reasons, don't you? But um, yeah, I think on a yeah on a personal scale, when you're that age, doing something like that is, you know, you never dream you're going to do anything better than that. Do you know what I mean? That's kind of that's great. You just go with the flow, really. Um, since then, I've been hanging out of helicopters in Rio and done quite a few crazy things so you know so the the ladder you just kind of climbing up the ladder really and doing stranger and stranger requests so uh yeah 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 that's very true stranger and stranger that i mean from a from the most exciting to to the most um interesting or how would i say sort of the, the almost the, the best the one the shoot that you sort of felt the best about doing um, would you say that's the work for Orsted you mentioned? I, I mentioned, sorry, this recent shoot? Yeah, I'd say recently. Um, I feel quite involved with it all. We were involved, um, it was a rebrand for Orsted. They were a uh, Danish uh, oil and gas nationalised company and they rebranded to Orsted and dropped all their black energy. And now all their energy comes from wind power. Um, and we were involved in you know how they were going to communicate all this. And, the, and it was just... Fantastic, you know, they're actually doing it as a nation. They they're doing this for the environment mm. and it's and they've done it. And being involved with that and being asked to produce the imagery to kind of get it off the ground was just stunning. And they you know, we worked together as a proper team. It was just uh, I've never worked on anything quite like it actually. We weren't told, right, you need to take a picture like this or like that. It was kind of we just brought all the ideas together and worked worked in an ongoing situation for about four years with it. So, um, yeah, just truly really lovely to work on and really nice to work with people that really think about what they're doing. It's kind of, yeah. Feel good. Feel good factor in Yeah, definitely. In yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's very nice. I mean, that's a long, that's a long gig uh, yeah. to, to have. So, I mean, that's a lot of work. If you go onto Patrick's website, there's a, a load of amazing work from or for Orsted. Kids jumping off towers and, and all sorts of uh, people in parks and bikes. Um, really, really strong and obviously exactly the type of imagery, imagery that you'd expect from, from Patrick after what we've discussed. Um, but obviously recently, you know, tracking things things um, to closer times, uh, you know, kind of COVID has changed uh, changed quite a lot for or rather well, changed the world quite a lot and obviously work for photographers um do you think uh, or rather should I say have you given thought to kind of different ways that you're going to need to do business or run your your shoots going forward in light of in light of all this um I don't know if you'd have asked me that question six weeks ago I would have been struggling for an answer really because I don't think we we would have thought there was a way out of it do you know what I mean it's yeah. kind of Pretty, pretty gloomy. But now, as things start slowly getting back to normal, I hope um, things might get back to the way they were. I think shoots might be the productions might be smaller on the commercial shoots, uh, less people. Uh, there probably won't be so many exciting locations involved. Everything will be kind of a little bit smaller and a bit, a little bit more niche, um, which is fine by me, really. You know, that's kind of I don't mind working like that. So that's. <laughs> Yeah, okay, discussing. as long as the work comes in. That's what of we course, need. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We need those marketing budgets, so yeah. But I mean, on on um, on that touch, have you seen over? Well, this isn't necessarily really related to, to COVID, but so generally, have you seen any sort of changes in um, in in the type of imagery and trends over over the year? You know, over the years. I mean, having worked at Red Bull myself and managed photography there, we saw mm. it was always about authenticity. Uh, and always yeah. about sort of real imagery and and you know there's a lot of a lot of photography work out there that's uh fabricated shall we say so if you do you personally have any kind of feel or, or or thoughts on that i think for a few years now last two or three years everything you know all the clients are requesting real people real situations okay. authenticity <laughs> you know even though you kind of go about it the same way you, you cast models and, you know, you choose locations and you're kind of making it all up, but definitely the outcome needs to look believable and kind of relatable as well, you know. 
So, um, yeah, and I think that's definitely going to continue post-COVID. I can't see a way that's going to change in a hurry. So, uh, yeah. So Probably more, go down even further down that road. You? Yeah. More natural people, less models who can't hold cameras or ride bikes or do kickboxing or whatever. Yeah, there's nothing worse, right? So, <laughs> someone <laughs> pretending to do something like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't. It definitely doesn't work. Really, no, no I, I couldn't agree more. Um, all right, well, look, uh, tips. You know, I've, we've, I, I thought it'd be a nice idea to touch on some tips because clearly a man with a few little tricks up your sleeve, uh, as as we've discovered from you micro adjusting or your equipment. What would you give tip wise to people who you think are sort of just starting out, or, or not even just starting out, but doing, been doing it for a while, but looking for a, a bit of a change? Um, in, in the way that they shoot, um, just trying to try to find your own way of doing things, really, and try not to be influenced too much by other people, uh, and don't try to. I mean, it's great to copy other people's, you know, how they've done it to kind of learn technically. That kind of thing's really cool. But I think in order to get someone, which is the goal, to get someone to commission you, they have to feel that they know what they're going to get. So you have to somehow develop some sort of continuity to it and I think that can only come by shooting things that you like to shoot things that you're interested in because if you try to fake it a little bit I think that's kind of a bit obvious and people will see around that so yeah it's hard but it's kind of stick to your guns and kind of yeah do what you like doing that that's, way you might stick at it as well you know there's a, good, a better of, chance of yeah. course but do what you believe in Shoot what mm. you shoot what you want to shoot. I think that's a great line because yeah. Yeah, it's very easy to spend your life kind of recreating other people's work. But mm. uh, you know, if, if you're actually doing what you want to do and you're doing it for the right reasons and enjoying it, then it's going to grow. It's going to get better, surely. And, and I think well, you're clearly a testament to that. Um, Orsted wouldn't have commissioned you for four years if uh, if that wasn't the case. For sure. Um, do you find any any particular sort of tips when you're on on set? You know, you mentioned that you can be sometimes being on a set with twenty five people. Uh, yeah, that could be that can be stressful. There's a lot of a lot of people's opinions flying around, a lot of people's egos. You know, do you do you have any particular way of dealing with that yourself? Um, I don't try not to let my ego out the bag. I think it's you don't have of, an ego. Uh, no, I try not to. I think, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of hard. It's really tough. I mean, I think everyone struggles in that environment. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's a difficult way to take, to take nice pictures. But um, I just think you've got to try and keep everybody happy on set, you know. It's kind of, and if it is really stressful and things start to kick off, you don't have to show that you're phased by that or bothered by that. It's kind of, you've just got to be Mr. Happy and just kind of keep it all swinging along. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's where you can, it's kind of, yeah. I like that tip. It's very, it's, it's, it's extremely true. Um, I think it it relates really to this industry as a whole if you're a photographer because you've got endless plates that you have to, to spin, uh, endless duties to do. And, you know, that's very similar to obviously being on set and trying to deal with the art director or the the lighting or the wardrobe or obviously the subjects and you've got to be happy, cool, calm, collected the entire time. And or appear that way on, you know. That's, well, that's yeah, exactly. Uh, that, yeah. yeah, so you're saying that actually you're a swan and your legs are oh, <laughs> freaking out underneath. But that's, yeah, that's a, a, very, um, a very good observation, a good tip, I think. Uh, yeah. keep, yourself, keep yourself calm. Yeah, a camera is fantastic to hide behind as well, you know. It you is, know, yeah. You can just keep it, keep it on your face, and then just like shut it all out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's what, that's very, very good, very, very good tip. Um, so look, we're we're coming up to the the end of our our, our interview time. Um, I think uh, that that topic that we've just discussed really relates very nicely to something you mentioned at, at uni, which is as as a photographer. Um, you have to learn to juggle multiple things, and you referenced uh, you referenced uh, this happening at university. You were sort of struggling to juggle 
um, multiple things. And yeah, I think I, I, I literally learned to juggle at uni. I think that was probably one of the only, the most important things I learned to do. <laughs> Just while you're waiting for the color print to drop out of the machine, you know, most people went for a cigarette or something and then you can't teach yourself to juggle, you know, and it's kind of... And that... that day, I can juggle, I can entertain the kids, I can kind of... You can, life's full of juggling stuff, isn't it? You know, that's what we all have to do, so, yeah. That yeah. is... That is great, yeah. Well, I, I actually, it's funny when, when we were discussing this and you, you sent me some notes and you said at uni you learned to juggle. I actually thought you meant that you kind of, you figured out in your mind how to juggle multiple projects all at the same time. But you actually meant <laughs> actually how to, learned to juggle. juggle. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, that's good. So there you go. If you're ever struggling... In photography, go and learn to juggle by the printer and everything will turn out like a bed of roses. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's the tip from today. I love it. So, yeah. look, Pat, um, final parting question. Um, I'm not sure how long I'll be putting this to people. I might change this going forward, uh, depending upon how COVID kind of takes, um, takes the world again. But can you name me one thing that you think will change forever as a result of it? And it doesn't have to be with in relation to the photography industry, but just just if it does, that's fine. Can you? Um, I'd say one thing that I'd like to come out of it um, would be for the air quality in London to improve, um, because for the past couple of months, cycling around London with no cars on the streets has been an absolute joy. Um, you know, it's, no cars is one thing, but the air quality, and when you live in London, you live in Hackney in East London, it's like the difference has been, you know, just amazing. Um, it's a pleasant place to live for that reason. So, and it's kind of the last couple of weeks, the traffic's been building up and you can you can smell it and you can feel it coming back to almost like normal. So, um, yeah, I just hope the powers to be see something in that and maybe, you know, make a bit more room for cycling and walking and, a bit less room for the motor vehicle and for the petrol engine and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, we can all live in nicer smelling cities. Yeah, yeah well, we can definitely <laughs> live in hope of that. And, you know, with your – maybe 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 we should put together a sort of deck of images to present it to, the, to the, the council and hopefully they'll listen as to the difference it's made. Um, I yeah. certainly agree with you on that one and would, would love to see it. Um, I've seen the air quality change here in Bath and – this is a fraction of, of what London and bigger cities have to deal with. So, so yes, let's see, let's see how it how it progresses and how it changes. So, all right. Well, I think that was that was a really excellent conversation, talking about and, and reviewing some of those beautiful pictures that you've spent thirty years curating and creating, uh, especially curating in the last couple of months. Wish you uh, massive amounts of luck with, with Spotted for you. Uh, I'll Thank put you. the I'll put the link into the, uh, the 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 text underneath the YouTube talk, um, and obviously this will be live on the channel for you to share to all of your loved ones and all of your clients going forward. Um, but for now, uh, just leaves me to say good luck with well, obviously next few months and see where things go. It's been a pleasure chatting to you, and you too. Go and enjoy the uh, go and enjoy the hot weather. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks so much, Charlie. It was really good. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Cheers, Pat. Bye-bye. So thanks very much for joining. That was great to have Pat, um, Pat on this week. Next week, I will be speaking to uh, Dean Tremel, a Kiwi uh, photographer based in Switzerland who has spent uh, almost as many years, I think, as, as Pat uh, shooting. So do join me then. Uh, in, the, uh, in the meantime, all the videos from... This week and previous are all on the YouTube channel, so do scroll through, have a look at them, uh, and feel free to, to comment uh, and subscribe. That uh, All that leaves me to say is thanks very much for joining, and until the next time, cheerio.